Да-да-да. Rejoice, I bring you good news for all people. Tonight the angels sing on earth.
Merry Christmas. My name, my name is Kenny Bath, and this is my family. Courtney Bath, Riley Bath, Cliff Bath, and McKinley Bath. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. Tonight, angels far and near sing tender lullabies. Well-worn fabric holds in the warmth of a parent's love. Animals and shepherds glowing with adoration move in closer for a better look, while the muffled cry of a newborn baby greets the world. On Christmas Eve, we light the Christ candle for the child king, the infant redeemer, the savior of the world, and nothing will ever be the same. Thanks be to God. you join me in your bulletin as we share together in the invitation to Holy Communion and the prayer of confession and pardon. Christ our Lord invites to his table all, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God of love and mercy, all year long we pursue security, power, admiration, and money. Yet you come to us in simplicity and weakness. All season long, we covet great material blessings when you alone offer what is lasting. Through the work of this child, our Lord Jesus who comes among us full of grace and truth. Forgive us, heal us, correct us, and give us a passion for your goodness. Then open our lips that we may sing your praise with the angels and make our lives a witness to your transforming love. Through Christ, your anointed one, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Please stand as we sing together our next hymn, hymn number 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Thank <laughs>
please remain standing for the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Hear this good news. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. You may be seated.
remain standing as you are able, in body or in spirit. And know that we bring the gospel reading to the center of the people as a reminder that Christ is the living word among us. Hear now the reading of the gospel of Luke, the second chapter. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which is told them concerning this child. And all that they had heard, it w and all they that heard it, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary, keeping all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard as it was told unto them. May God add to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of God's holy word. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Glorious God in Jesus, your grace appears, bringing salvation to all. Help us to ponder your words of love by the light of your spirit, that we may proclaim glad tidings of peace and welcome Christ in our world. Amen. The legend says that when Russian Empress Catherine II was touring the newly acquired regions of Crimea with her foreign ambassadors, one of her ministers, Grigory Potemkin, had constructed fake portable villages so that when these dignitaries floated by on Catherine's royal barge, the party would see on the shoreline the fabulous new towns the empire had won 
giving the impression that Russia had acquired all of that wealth and prosperity. But after the royal barge passed, these sham villages would be taken down and reassembled further down the route so that the barge of dignitaries would be impressed yet again. The buildings were just fronts, hollow. From a distance, they looked real. They were kind of like the old Hollywood sets used for old Western movies. The movie scene from the exterior shot made the building look real, but there was nothing inside of those buildings. The interior shots for the movie were made at the Hollywood studio. And when you saw the movie, you couldn't tell that the old Western town was mostly a fake. If you believe many Christmas card scenes that you have viewed through the years, as well as depictions on Facebook, Bethlehem Beyond the Manger is basically a still, placid village. It's a calm and quiet town as the shepherds pass through. And they seem to go directly on their way to the only barn with a manger in town where Jesus was laying. Sometimes our picture of Jerusalem extends to this crusty old guy with a no vacancy sign as the innkeeper. But our focus on that night and on this one is on the manger and Mary and Joseph and of course the baby Jesus. But for many of us, the rest of Bethlehem beyond the manger is an empty set, a Potemkin village. Yet like, yet Luke goes into great detail about the circumstances about Bethlehem that brought Mary and Joseph there. To claim the detail that Luke gives means that that night was anything but quiet and still. That night, it was a town of family reunions going on all over the place as family members returned from the far reaches of the territory. Far-flung family members were coming back home to the old family place as generations squeezed into the home place, into the living quarters together, sleeping on couches or on the floor. Does any of this sound familiar? eating around the first century equivalent of card tables. And like most families, they were glad to see each other and laughed and ate and drank together. Family celebrations filled the streets. Families and friends were united. And as you know from your own experience, these kind of gatherings are rarely calm and rarely quiet. But as in any village or hometown, there were also those family members whose homecoming was not as joyous or festive. There were those who left home out of hurt feelings or because of limited opportunities in the little town of Bethlehem or for some other reason. But on that night, they were back home with all of the resentments and animosity unpacked and spilling into the streets. This was real life in the streets of, and the homes of Bethlehem that night. It was far from quiet and still. Luke reminds us it was not a joyous holiday that swelled the population of Bethlehem to two or three times its normal size, but a government decree. These people were forced to leave jobs and homes far away to make the long trek back home. They endured a loss of income the disruption of a routine, and the hazards of long travel. All to find out how much they would have to pay the government in royal taxes, the foreign government of Caesar. That was, after all, the reason behind Caesar's census decree. Beyond the family drama, Bethlehem was a town of political tension. Bethlehem was a swirl of human reality that night. Family love and family tension, 
job and financial concerns, rivalries and relationships, joys and doubts. Bethlehem was fully alive. I wonder if people two or three streets over from the manger even knew what was happening with Mary and Joseph. Bethlehem was not a Potemkin village. It was not an empty movie set. It was real. You and I spend a lot of time building our own Potemkin villages. But the ones that you and I construct, they're not made out of paper mache or light balsam. But we make these elaborate fronts nonetheless. Our goal is not to fool the Empress Catherine and her royal party. Our goal is to fool the people around us, our neighbors, our friends, our family, and strangers on the street. We construct these fronts because we want them to think that everything in our lives is fine, is normal, good. We want people to think that our health and our job situation is above average. And we try to convince our neighbors that our family is free of tension and problems that plague other people, but not us. We make our lives look good from a distance. But if people come up close and look inside of us, they would see a different story. If you look close enough, you see the cracks and the facade that covers what is really going on. We know all too well the private stresses of family conflict. We know the quiet desperation of a job that brings not enough pay or offers too much internal conflict and consternation. We do an adequate job of hiding our shame our despair, our regret, and our resentment. Sometimes we construct our Potemkin villages not to fool the people out there, but to seemingly unconsciously deceive ourselves. We put on a good show to deny what we're feeling inside, to cover up our emptiness, our pain, our fear. We're content to focus only on the positive as we avoid or numb what is truly happening inside of us. And sometimes, so that people won't look at us, we call attention to someone else because we want our lives to look like the ideal Bethlehem of the Christmas card. As Bethlehem was not a hollow set with a bold false front, neither are we. The beauty of Christmas is that God sees past our false fronts. God sees past all of our projections of all the things that we try to hide and deny. God sees past those things. And God loves us anyway. The Word, John says, became flesh and dwelled among us. Christ was born not only in that idyllic scene with angels and shepherds, he was born in the greater reality of Bethlehem, a human place of love and hate, nobility and depravity. The good news of Christmas is that God became flesh and dwelled among us in the fullness of our lives not just in the highlight reels that we want the world to see, in the fleeting and often false fronts and attempts at normality that we project. The good news is that God came in Christ to offer us full life, abundant life, life beyond the highlight reel and the Potemkin village. Christ comes to us here and now in the totality of our lives. That's the way God wanted it to be from the very beginning. Christmas is the story of a homecoming 
of a reunion of God with humanity, of God making a home with us. Are you tired of constructing and living in a Potemkin village? Are you tired of living in an empty Hollywood set? Does it wear you out trying to look like you have it all together when inside your very soul there is a storm of hurt and harm, emptiness, bitterness, shame, or fear? Are you tired of constructing and living in a Potemkin village Tonight, God offers you more than a beautiful Christmas scene with poinsettias and lights and beautiful music. God offers you more. Christ comes to the reality, the totality of who you are, of who you wish you were not, and to the fullness of what God created you to be. God dwells among us to guide, heal, and forgive. Christ came into the world to fill the empty places of our lives and show us the way, the truth, and the life. And as surely as you hold the juice-soaked bread of communion in your hands tonight, Christ holds you in the heart of God. Christ is ready to dwell anew in your heart tonight, to dwell fully in all of your life, to enjoy an old-fashioned homecoming in your soul. And as we sing, joy to the world, the Lord has come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And now, will our ushers please come forward for the dedication of our tithes and offerings? Please be seated.
thank you, O oh God, for the gifts of this season and for the ways you equip and enable us to be agents of your grace and mercy. Use these gifts, O oh Lord, to further your kingdom in this place, in this church, and around the world. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The great Thanksgiving part of our service this night comes from the book of worship for uh, this Christmas Eve night. It is also found in your bulletin. But sometimes we get so frozen by the next word that we miss the moment. And so I invite you to not only read, but listen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away, 
and our love failed, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And at his birth, the angels sang, Glory to you in the highest, and peace to your people on earth. And so, with all your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, as Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem and there found no room. So Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was despised and rejected. As in the poverty of a stable, Jesus was born. So by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Even as your word became flesh, born of a woman on a night long ago, we also remember another night in which you gave yourself up for us by taking bread and giving thanks and breaking the bread and giving it to his disciples. As he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, drink from this, all of you. This, this is the cup of forgiveness, this is the cup of salvation. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we Proclaim the ancient mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world. The body of Christ redeemed by his blood and by his love. By your Spirit, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor, all glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now I invite the deacon of this place, our associate pastor, Angela Marshall, to come and give instruction. As we prepare to come forward for this meal, we want to remind you that this is not the table of Trinity, nor is it the table of the United Methodist Church. This is the table of our Lord, and so all who wish to come and to participate in this meal are welcome. This is an open table. As you come forward, we will receive communion through the method of intention. So if you would come forward with your hands ready to receive, the bread will be placed in your hands and then you will dip the bread into the cup and receive both elements at once. We will have a gluten-free station available for those of you that are in need of a gluten-free station and it will be right to your right, my left. Uh, you'll come forward at the urging of the ushers or the invitation of the ushers, and so if you would just follow their lead, we will have four additional stations, two here at the front and two at the rear of the church. Oh, and one in the balcony, sorry, thank you. Um, but we want to remind you, this is an open table. You are welcome. Come and feast. Will those who are assisting with communion please come forward at this time?
John 8, 12. Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life.
see the difference it makes when you share the light which Christ has put in you. The Lord bless you and keep you, look with love upon you, be gracious and cause your faith to shine with peace. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Savior close beside us, God's love from harm to hide us, the Spirit's power to guide us evermore. Amen. Go now in peace.